Hello, and welcome to Mainer's Natter with RJ, Transcending Imagined Differences. Today, uh, my guest is an old friend that I've, I've known since moving to Portland. Uh, in fact, we, I was introduced to her initially because I was looking for an apartment, and uh, she happened to rent uh, uh, the upstairs of her house, and I stayed with her for a, a year or so. We parted ways since then, but uh, uh, a few years back, we, we can reconnected in a surprising little uh, uh, gift that she gave me, which was uh, a, a piece, an article in the newspaper that she works for, which I didn't know until she told me after. I had to figure that out. Mm -hmm. but, but today, uh, my, my guest uh, uh, is here to talk about the, the times and what's happening right now, but also about her own history and perspective. So uh, without much ado, let me introduce uh, Melissa Pritchard uh, as my guest. Thanks. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Mm. I appreciate you having me. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I wanted to start off with, with uh, it's interesting how this came about. We, we have often conversations just about all types of different topics and, yeah. um, and subject matters, and we seem to have really good conversations. And I really recognized how uh, here we are, two different people from different places that have come to uh, move and settle in Maine to become new, our new Mainers in yeah. a sense, um, and, and recognizing what's going on right now. So I, I just wanted to start off with, with just talking about who you are and, and uh, where you, your, your wonderful beginnings started. Yeah. Well, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and as we've been having these great conversations about Black Lives Matter and what's going on this year and how tumultuous these things have been, but we always have these great conversations about race. And reflecting on that, my childhood in Detroit, I was conscious of the race riots in 1967. Mm -hmm. I distinctly recall National Guard troops going down the, the main street, and there was a lot of racial awareness in my family and household in general. My parents were just... they. There was a lot of black literature on the bookshelves. There was um, black jazz, a lot of jazz being played, and my parents were very um, pro Martin Luther King. And I just so there was all there were often conversations mm. about race, and it was tumultuous, right? Because right. I was raised to believe that civil rights was a great movement and a great thing, and prejudice was bad, and that these riots were going on that were and it was scary for a kid. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I've been reflecting on that a lot since you and I have been talking. Right, right. I, and um, we, I have to say, we had a discussion earlier just about that, and I didn't know anything about your past. And also, uh, coming from a way that I am right. and coming here in my adulthood, um, didn't fully understand or realize the, the continual kind of uh, uh, fight for rights and equality that's been going on in America, and your experience in that as a child. Yes, you know? and it being palpable. It was this right. thing people talked about and seeing it on television. Right. There was a Vietnam War going on and there were protests and the, you would see civil rights marches on television right. and it had a lot of impact of my racial awareness as a child that these politics mattered and they were happening wow. and people were... In, you know, standing up. Right, right. It's a time of great people standing, <laughs> Americans standing up, right. creating change. How brilliant. I, I was reflecting on how at that time uh, what was happening in London and then subsequently England. Again, myself up very young, you know, being coming into my teens. And uh, uh, in England, what we have... We have race, we have immigration, but we have class. That's the biggest piece there is, is that sense of working class, middle class, and, and upper class. Mm -hmm. and, and really the two classes are, is around education, and the last class is really birthright. And so, so um, what our existential fight was really about, you know, being heard as a working class uh, party of people. So as we were growing up and being becoming uh, part of the school systems, um, there was no black people that were in positions of power, very oh. few, if any right. at all. Um, but within the working class milieu, particularly of my age, where we all mix, there was a real push 
um, I, I don't know if you know, but it was during the period of Margaret Thatcher, yeah. all right? So I think it was your Reagan time there. Yeah. Um, and really kind of um, uh, pushing around the uh, uh, conflicts that were going on, uh, things that we were involved in that, that people just didn't agree upon, particularly about nuclear weapons as well that were stationed yeah. in England. Yeah. So, so the working class, particularly around the 80s, really started to kind of gel together as one big people, you know. Um, and, and was there a big political shift? Like, because doesn't the Labour Party represent more than middle, the working class? Absolutely. And so did they come to power after Margaret Thatcher? Yes, uh, they did, yeah. So yeah. they kind of got together and pushed right. for a change. And had a, had a real change in that period of time. So this is me coming to age. And I wanted to highlight how for for myself and, and, and my, my uh, people, um, and I mean all Brits, at an age, it was music. Um, the amalgamations of different sounds we had from ska music to Boy George to uh, a punk and reggae mixing together, that was ska music is, black and white musicians playing together. And, and as a kid, seeing that happening and all different types of people represented right. in this, our stars, the people who are representing who we are, and we really looked up to those people. So that, right. that was the existential sh shift in England, was that age group um, yeah. and, and that period of time. So that helped form, it seems to me, the, the more I get to know you, that the, your sense that you, differences just get transcended right. in so many ways, including music. Mm -hmm. And I was sharing with you about how coming up in the early 70s as a preteen and young teenager, there was just this explosion of black music, black entertainment, um, black pride, black mm -hmm. power, mm -hmm. you know, and following after the riots, it was, again, re really interesting to be coming up, to be a white American and thinking about race. And so the good news is we were seeing more black faces on television, mm -hmm. hearing more black voices, and every girl I knew had a crush on Michael Jackson. <laughs> and, you know, it was just right. so, so normalizing blackness in American culture right. was really good. I think some of the naivety that I had, and I think maybe a lot of Americans had, is we just thought it was, oh, okay, so now everything's good. <laughs> right, right. And, and we're finding out, of course, it, it hasn't been good. Yeah, yeah, you, you, and, and, and that kind of, you know, brings us up to, you know, you being here. Um, what I recognize in America is there, that we go through these leaps or these existential times of awareness, but we, we end up kind of petering out, mm. shall we say. It seems to go back into the yeah. milieu. Um, I, but before we you know, proceed, I wanted to kind of talk about you know, your time in Maine yeah. and what brought you here yeah. and, 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 and how you find it right up until the present day, at least yeah. to the start of this year. Well, I moved from Detroit to New York City the day after I graduated, no, the day after I turned 18, actually. <laughs> and I went wow. to art school in New York City and <laughs> lived with my grandparents. And I mean, what an experience to be 18 years old in New York City. It was great. <laughs> and Absolutely. I was, yeah, there for about three years. And I had to drop out of college. I ran out of money. Yeah. Um, and then my family was moving up to Boston. So I've kind of made my way up the East Coast. In Boston, I was there for a lot of years, 10, 12, I, I forget exactly. Right. Um, and I finished up college there at mm -hmm. the museum school in Tufts. Um, Excellent. Yeah, and it's great <laughs> because I lived in a lot of different neighborhoods and the, I, I just have to live in a city. I, mm. I just think cities are so vibrant and alive. Um, and then my ex-husband and I, we had two little kids and we just didn't necessarily love where we were living. And Maine, we'd visit, and it's so beautiful here. And right, it, right. It, life looked easier than Boston. Boston was getting very, you know, there was a lot yeah. going on. I just wanted a, a city, but a more accessible city. And Portland has been perfect. I, I'm really glad I raised my kids here. And mm. um, I love the vibrancy of the culture. And it's diverse. And I love Maine. It's right, just so right, beautiful. Right, yeah. Every year I live here, I love it more. I've been here 20 years now. 20 years. Yeah. Right, right. So we've actually about the same about, about a time. I've uh -huh. been uh, stateside about 20 years. And most of that, 18, has been in Maine itself. So yeah. maybe a little less than that. But uh uh, I have to say, moving from um, England, when I initially came here, I first was in New York, New York, New York, um, worked right there, then Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I was, when I came over, I worked as a wilderness therapist. So I worked with adjudicated youth. I worked with basically uh, young Americans is what I worked with, wow, with, yeah. with uh, uh, 
within the correction system, kind of given a, a last chance. Um, and then moved to Arizona as well and lived in Arizona for a little period of time as well uh, before moving up to uh, Maine and, and settling in Maine. Um, and what I find is that uh, Maine is very much like uh, how England is culturally, maybe Middle England. It's, a, it's an interesting one. That is. Yeah, it, you wouldn't believe it. Compared to the rest of America, where yeah. America has its own style, uh -huh. but when you when you live in Maine, there is a there is a what should I say a je ne sais quoi a a beauty a a character uh -huh. that is different to the other parts of America. Don't you think part of that is there's a reserve yes. in Maine, right? Some, reservedness yes yeah. yeah you're right there yeah. is but it, but it, and and i wanted to to share this piece is my you know you know my time being here and it still continues to be this way is that my time in maine has been the most uh, uh inclusive and the most and the most successful for me um as hard and easy that it is um i think i've been probably more accepted here than I have anywhere else in the United States. That is States, so interesting isn't it? to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not contradictory per se, but it's just interesting because it's it's such a white state. Absolutely. And it's kind of, I find, you know, it takes a while to get people to warm up. Yes. But you're, you're really, you're really out there. You're very <laughs> warm. So maybe people just warm up to you readily. Right, right. And I think, you know, I think Mainers are Mainers. Brits are the same. Ah. So they, they are, they're, they're friendly, but they'll keep you at, at bay until they figure out who yeah. you are. Yeah, yeah. And then they'll... And, once and then they, you have a friend for life. Then you have a friend for life, <laughs> right. yeah. They'll stop a bullet for you. Yeah, you know, yeah. Almost. So, so uh, not that we have that many guns in England. But, right. but, uh, <laughs> but, but in that sense, so yes, it takes time for people to feel uh, safe and comfortable with you. But as in general, um, more accepted than not. And I think that's what's brought me back. because I left and then came back to Maine. So it's so I just wanted to kind of recognize that one as a black man um, being here from away, as we as they like to say in Maine yeah. and how I've made my career and my life here. Um, and and, it's, and I'm very passionate about that. Yeah. You know, um, a, a little segue I, I wanted to add was any immigrant that I see, any refugee that I see that comes over to America or even to a Maine uh, has that same drive and that same passion. Mm -hmm. I haven't met any that haven't. And I just wanted to, just to put that piece out there is, is, is how much they are happy and, and excited about starting a new life in a safe place where there's a possibility of equality and happiness. Yes, and safety. And safety. Yeah, and it's, education for their kids. Right, right. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and access to opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly the same reason why my, my parents came over from Jamaica to England. Mm -hmm. So we're talking in the 50s right. because of better education for uh, uh, prosperity and possibility and for them to be able to have something stable so they can look after their children so right. they give their children opportunity, myself and my brother. So interesting. So it's troubling though, isn't it? That like there's such an anti-immigration thing yeah. happening right now yeah. because as we all discussed a million times, we're all immigrants. Right. So why now? Like, isn't it interesting, right, that, yeah, absolutely. that Black Lives Matter is rising and all this other conflict, it just thinks that the contrast, the dichotomy, it's it's polarizing. Right. And yet we're coming together in other ways, right, like right, conversations right. like this. Yeah, absolutely. Right, I, right, and, really. and brilliant uh, segue, because I wanted to talk about the, particularly this last year and and the extraordinary things that have happened to uh, awaken Americans of all types and, 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 and kinds. Um, for myself, I, uh, I see this as a, this cultural existential shift and awareness that has happened where uh, a number of elements have happened, such as um, the pandemic, so that's thrown almost 40 million people out of work just in America itself. And the murdering, witnessing and the murdering of a black person uh, filmed. This is the where the media comes in. Right. It, it really came together in the sense that everyone suddenly woke up. Yeah. That's how it felt to right. them. You know? Well, we were talking earlier about Detroit and about, so the uh, historians tell us that Television helped bring the civil rights movement to mm -hmm. white Americans. And when you see 
black teenagers <laughs> and just people who are marching peacefully be assaulted by fire hoses in the 60s, right. that helped galvanize white Americans to ask for more change and demand more change. And now here we are 50 years later, 60 years later, and the same thing is happening. And because of media, and speaking as, you know, the privileged middle-class white woman that had just been reflecting on this a lot, is I, I know so many people have where the, it's happening again in the streets mm -hmm. and you identify with these peaceful protesters are being tear gassed on American streets. It just seems inconceivable. Mm -hmm. And they're just asking for justice. And you know that if white men were being murdered by police at the rate that black men are, We'd be riding in the streets. Right. And so now we're coming together again with media, helping us see and that, like the images, I mean, of course I identified with the white housewives in Portland, Oregon, who are right. gathering together right. saying, silence makes me complicit. I can't be silent. We all recognize that now for with our fellow Americans. Right. So that gives me hope. Yeah, yeah. The, it's a terrible time though, because there's so much violence and it doesn't seem hopeful in so many ways, but now there's more empathy, it seems. Yeah, yeah. Right? And historically, across the globe, you usually have a, an event in a yeah. country, in a, in a people that shifts consciousness. Yes. And often it's something that is uh, uh, fantastical or, uh, or terrible or tragic that shifts people's consciousness, wakes them up and yeah. realize of their own mortality and who do they want to be. And who do they want their country to be, right? Exactly. What kind of country? In America, we have all these ideas about equality and we're having to come to face to face with the fact that it's 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 still not equal. It's right. terribly unequal. Right, right. The, the, the balance of wealth is becoming more unequal, all these factors. Right. And so we're all putting ourselves in others' shoes. Yeah, and, and, and I think as Americans, everybody's doing it. Yeah. And, and they're coming to different conclusions and emotional affects from them. If I believe uh, there's these almost two sides in that big fat middle is that uh, you have on one extreme fear, fear of change, fear that, that they become irrelevant, fear of losing control of, of money, uh, the narrative, you know, politics. S and supremacy. And supremacy, <laughs> yes, the eliteness <laughs> yeah, of that. Right. And, and that that fear of what that looks like yeah. and what that might be. Um, and then this other side that, that recognizes that we're all human beings underneath. And that if I don't want somebody uh, harassing and in the end murdering me, neither do you. Right. And, and that's yeah. the point. Yeah. What society do we want to live in? Yes. You know? And to seeing someone die on film, it's been horrible. Mm. I haven't seen that video, particular mm. video, but I've seen enough and we've seen enough news coverage to know that it, it's people are reacting really viscerally right. to seeing this happen again and again and again. Right. And prolific, very prolific in, right. in that change. Right. I, I also believe that, um, uh, you know, what looking upon what's happening right now and this seemingly kind of uprising of people, that it, it has a positive result. Um, uh, right now, we are having this discussion, um, and we have discussions anyway, so we're kind of doing it already. Yeah. But, but what I love about our interaction and our conversations is that here we are of two people, different genders, from different countries, from not even from within Maine, and we can come together and have a discussion about race, yeah. about identity, right. about humanness, right. and, and come from our different perspectives. Okay. And what we have in common is an empathic understanding of what suffering is mm. and, an em and an empathic understanding of what, to f what it is to feel sa want to feel safe and want to feel um, that we can move forward and be, be proactive and be positive, do you yeah. know? And I think that's what joins us, I, you know. Yeah, you know. I agree. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I do a so, uh, little volunteer work with mm. literacy with the Portland Adult Ed, and it's so great to meet these people from all over. Um, some of the classrooms, it's just a melting pot. It's, you know, folks from East Africa, West Africa, <laughs> Christian, Muslim, mm. people from South America, Central America, um, folks from Asia, and they all, they have such hope to be in America. Yeah. It's, it really, it's right. wonderful to work with them, you know, they're out, and they just, like you say, 
They want to be safe. Exactly. They want opportunity. Their kids go to safe, wonderful schools. And that's why I just think Portland is getting richer and richer right. and Lewiston. And it'll be interesting to see as Maine, because our economy needs right. immigrants, right? right? Folks you, from away. Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so these kind of conversations have to be had because you're right. right. If it's fear, then we're not talking about it. And if people are worried about being politically incorrect, and I know I've, I've said, I, I mean, I White people just have a world of privilege where we say and assume things or we don't assume things that, um, that we need We need to talk and we need right. to hear. And there's so many things I've learned from you in terms of microaggressions you've right. experienced right. professionally and personally that, again, the empathy mm -hmm. helps me understand, wow, it's, it's, a, it's a different road to walk to be black in America. Right. Yeah. And the more we talk, the more we're just... Yeah. Two people in America. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Wanting wanting to do the best that we can and wanting to be successful. And help and bring others along too. Yeah, right? and not the stamp all everybody. over other people right. to do it. You're right. right. Ex exactly. That's the humane way of doing that. Yeah. Um, we were, um, excuse me while I just look at my notes right here, um, about how uh, uh, the reaction with black people right now that are in my kind of sphere. So in my job, I, I, I basically help and guide people. I'm a psychotherapist, so I help and guide people. Um, and this year has, has suddenly seen this influx of more black people coming in to see me through my profession. Now, in general, um, and this is again part of the uh, American legacy, and I think this is the same in England as well, about uh, safety and and being vulnerable. Uh, black people traditionally don't go to therapy. Interesting. Right? They don't go, and men yeah. particularly don't as well. Right. So it's interesting to suddenly see this influx. One, I do believe, because um, they suddenly see this black person who is, um, you know, educated uh, and is pro-black, pro-human, you know. Right. Um, and, and maybe they can relate to, feel that they can connect to. Right. Um, and the... The, the overriding kind of feelings that I, that I get are, are twofold. On one side, there is this sense of, oh, now you see it. Yeah, right. There's this real kind of feeling of like, my God, we've been saying this for ages and now you see it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. So but it's validating. It's validating yeah. in that sense of that sense of, oh, it's like a relief. Yeah. But on the other side, there is this kind of uh, um, quiet cautiousness to whether, to put it as simply as I can, can white Americans sustain this change that is needed to happen? Right. Um, you know, uh, in so many times in history, um, it is easy to distract uh, Americans off from one thing to another, and so things don't always go to fruition. Right. So that's the two sides that I see on my side. That anyway. is interesting. Yeah. And you and I talk about that in terms of what can be sustained and how does change actually happen and the smallness of conversations like this from uh, where I work at the Portland Press Herald, Black Lives Matter has brought to bear our CEO has created a diversity and inclusion council. Mm, yes. And you're going to be our first speaker <laughs> at, at a speaker <laughs> yes. series. Yes. But part of, so now there's institutional commitment across America, I can't speak specifically for how many corporations, mm. um, but the hope I imagine is it's not just lip service this time, it's how do we get more visibility for black people, black voice, people of color of all, you yeah. know, races, ethnicities, et cetera, and people who've been marginalized. Um, and I'm really encouraged to see that kind of commitment. I also am encouraged as a visual artist to see more and more black are being featured in this mm. one piece I saw a while ago that um, I captured on a slide for this show um, is a portrait of Sally Hemming with the Founding Fathers. Mm -hmm. And the artist whose name is escaping me, it's Titus something, I forgot. Um, he's in the credit on the slide. He takes the painting and he crumbles up all the white men and he frames Sally Hemming. And the name <laughs> of the painting is Enough About You. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. right? Enough About You, right, white right. folks. And in here, there's this whole history of black lives right. that have not been documented by art and literature or, right. until quite recently, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. they, and we need those voices. And the other painting of his that I love, it's a picture of a bunch of white men of, you know, regal bearing and their black slave and he he whitewashed out all the white people right <laughs> right yeah i love it yeah yeah the these suddenly these uh, you know black people who have been uh, invisible you know throughout invisible. not not catered for in american history when 
really, they're the ones that built the country. Do you know, from, from yeah. the White House itself to yes. all the fields so you can have the money and tobacco and cotton and all Made those us, things. Yeah, Made it's on their rich. backs. Yeah, it's on literally the, built on their backs. Yeah, literally born on their backs. And the best art in America is from black people. Right, right? right. And jazz is the greatest American art form there is, <laughs> and how they got ripped off again and again. I mean, that's the thing that I think just must be so frustrating: mm. is why, why, why do we keep ripping black yeah. people off? Yeah, you know, to, to we've created whiteness, and the class of England we've created here with white. Right, whiteness is a class unto itself, right. and it has to be broken down. You're right, and that's really scary too. Yeah, right? exactly, because it's change. Right, it's change, and and. What does that mean for all parties, but particularly those parties that hold on to that control and, and live that privilege? That it, that's the piece that's so frightening right. and reactionary to that. Right. Because it means owning and admitting what the history has been and how you systemically have benefited from that. Yeah. And then willing to change so that all people can benefit from being American. Do you know what I mean? So how do you think... Um, why do you think so many white folks immediately get so defensive? And I'm, and I'm sure I have too in some of these various conversations because you've had to examine something that you always took for granted, right? right. right? And what's the problem? Anyone can be, you know, get a great education and anyone can have access, but in fact they can't. And you and I were talking about how imagine living in a community that's got a lot of violence and a lot of danger right. and I'm a mother with kids and I can't move away right. because I don't have access to the money or those neighborhoods or those opportunities. Right. It's just b denied, right. Right. right, for yeah. many people of color. And so what do you think it is that so many white Americans currently are so defensive about it and don't want to have these conversations? I think, I think really, um, and, and a good question because we, we are, uh, uh, got a short amount of time oh. on that as well right now, but in a, in a whole, I believe that uh, it's, it is about the admitting that, oh my God, we've been living in, under this lie and America's not the image that we thought it was and what part have I played in that? And that takes a lot. Just as a psychologist, that takes a lot um, to come to. So it's much easier to be defensive than it is to uh, own that. That, re that, that takes uh, a lot of maturity and, and uh, a level so that you can actually hold that and then work with that. Right. You know, and, that, and I think that's the, that's the hardest piece. Right, and but, work with it productively. And work right? with it productively. And get away from blame or tr trying to take responsibility and accountability is different than blame. And maybe people, if they can pull away from that and more toward, okay, let's have more of these conversations. Let's make institutional commitments to change. You're right. And exactly. see where we go from here. Right. Let me, I have to stop right here just because okay. this is an amazing conversation. Yeah, really we, I have to stop right here just because of the time. But I hope that actually that we get to come back here and, and, and continue this conversation um, about uh, culture, race, identity, and the future uh, of particularly Maine, New England, and then the United States, at least from our perspective. So yes, thank that you. would be great. Thank you <laughs> thank for you. having me. You're welcome. It's really fun. And thank you for being here and thank you for for this show. Uh, very uh, live and electric and half an hour is never enough, but uh, I hope you will join us again uh, for to continue this conversation at another time and uh, we'll speak to you again later. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Brilliant. Well that was done. good, wasn't that? Yeah. yeah. I, you know and so you were, you were just talking about the proliferation of media, the ability to communicate to many people and right. how you can learn through that. Yeah. Um, um, I believe that your program, your show is doing a, a program to try and enlighten and to bring in uh, voices of difference into your, yeah. into your workplace. Yeah, so we're doing that with a diversity and inclusion initiative. Mm. And also I work in the advertising department and one thing we do is something called branded content where mm. we help um, businesses and institutions 
tell their stories in a different way, not like an ad, but more like what's the story behind, for instance, um, this person who works with prison reform. Right. And so some businesses, there are some advertisers who really want to help share those stories with Maine, which is fantastic. Right, right. And one thing I love about Maine, it's the kind of thing you're talking about with how Mainers, there's a, there's a core goodness yeah. to so many people who live here and want to make it a better place. So some of the branded content I work on highlights what Maine, why Maine is such a great place to live and right, also right. Um, how can we share other voices? Mm. So for instance, um, we had a series called Sustaining Maine, and it's about all these different people of all walks of life and all races and ethnicities coming together to help <laughs> create prison reform and um, youth in Lewiston right. and all sorts of things. And so this advertiser is telling their stories <laughs> and, right. and saying, hey, look what's happening in Maine. This is great. Right. Another initiative that we've started developing, it's called Same Here. Right. And it's just like what you're doing, which is, hey, just like me, same here. Same here. Here's my experience. <laughs> um, and even though people from all walks of life, how they got to Maine and how they're thriving here, um, these businesses want to be a part of helping to tell that story. Right. So that's exciting for me as a, a creative professional working in right. advertising that this is another way to get out in front of people. Right. These are other faces and other stories, mm -hmm. and they're just like you. In fact, one of the women in the series that we're hoping to feature, she talked about how they were doing farming work up in middle and northern Maine, and right. there was some community resistance, and she came to a town meeting, and she said, yeah, I'm just like you. I've got a teenager that, you know, <laughs> is giving me a hard time, right, and I've right. got to pay my bills too, and I just want a, a good life in Maine. So it's really fun to be a part of those kind of right. initiatives. Yeah, and and what a great kind of, uh, uh, you know, coming together of two different kind of um, energies. So yeah. advertising and business, and often seen as as the the bad business, right? But, and then and then ordinary people of all varieties, but particularly people of color that are, are yeah. coming in and their stories, yeah. but showing how, again, how they can work together, how they can um, complement one another yeah. for a mutual benefit, yes. you know, to tell the story, a very human story, yes. you know, and also for each company or each um, business that, that invests in that, to show that they have heart, to show that, you know, as Mainers, if you live here, then um, it is about more about the people than yes. anything else. And that these stories matter. These stories right. matter. And yeah. that the more when we talk about the dominant culture creates, to a large degree, that here's the important narrative. Right. Well, when more and more pieces of the dominant culture say, this is an important part of our story, too, right. then that people become more receptive and normalizes all these kinds of conversations right. and all these kind of voices and right. stories. Yeah. So I uh, and I suppose my last piece I wanted to kind of lead on to talking about coming together. Again, I've witnessed, um, and I'm thinking of this in generations. So so we think of our generation, and 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 our generation is, is having that existential argument right now of, of what is blackness, what is American, what is whiteness, and who are we? And so that's the the great. Um, battle right now, that battleground. I see that middle kind of age of that almost 25 to 35-ish or 40 that is actually going out there and doing the work, doing the demonstration, marching, shouting, um, all of that sort of stuff to bring it to the public and, and to protest what's going on. Um, and that particularly group is is even that group is mixed. This is the piece we started with, is, is that there's a real mixture of people. It's not just black people, but it's right. all people right. that see that see the light and recognize what's going on. This is, this is an important piece because that's the critical mass. That's the change. Critical mass. Right? Good that's phrase, the, yeah. yeah. That, that, that suddenly it's not just one sector people or another sector people, yeah. but it's all people that want a better America. Yes. You know? And I think even younger, and I'm exactly. so impressed by, we've talked about how impressive the young people are, because they're getting out there, and they're just much more com comfortable with biracial identity. Right. And, you know, back to your thing about the music in London in your years coming up, you know, now it's just, they're so much more comfortable with the amalgam all of, right. we're all coming together. And they're looking at broader issues. They're moving beyond race. They're looking at systemic problems and capitalism and right. political systems and climate change and right. they're coming together and it's there are hope 
Right, exactly. Yeah. exactly. I, I, and they don't see the differences that we, our generation right. does, right? Exactly. They just don't as they, much. Yeah, they really, they really don't. And they see people, right. you know? And, and then uh, even younger than that, I was going to say, it's like, and I'm talking about high school kind of age. Right. Impressive. It's amazing because yeah. it, it, it broadens. So if you live in Maine, it's not always about black and white, but it could be about gender identity. Sure, it sure. It could be about, um, you know, who and how you want to present yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, are you a person that's a bookworm person and just want to be this particular person? Are you a person that, that wants to be loud and be seen? Um, whatever that is, it's a, really about an acceptance. This is fundamentally what I see. And culture is part of that as well, but it, it's right. all different types of kind of supposed groups that we created that, that for them, it's, it's about more so about people and they live it yeah very they much live so. it. they live it so so they're looking at the planet or they're looking at the country to opposed to oh this is my country that's not your country right you know what i mean that, yeah. it's amazing when you talk to actual kids and what they're doing in schools and what they're hearing and where they're at in today's society in comparison to where i was at even you know what i mean you've talked about this a lot about how one thing that happens in america and I, I assume in Europe as well, but yeah. that we, we kind of get conditioned to believe there's not enough, right? Right, There's right. this idea there aren't enough resources, there's not enough stuff, there aren't enough TVs and right. shoes and things for us to buy and make ourselves okay, right? Right, right. And I think it's interesting how with pleading and limited resources, that creates fear, right. but among some of the, the young people you see out there, they're like, okay, the only solution has to be coming together, right? <laughs> right. We have to come together right. Right. because we, and we need to share the resources more equitably. So they're, they're trying to create unity. Who knows like how instinctively that is. Right. Um, and it's also interesting about how marginalized groups have demanded change. They've had mm. to demand it. And some people react negatively to the anger, but for so many of us, that feels like perfectly natural. Right. That is the next necessary and appropriate step. Right. They must be heard. And you have to, you, you, you have to they've asked and asked and asked and right. asked, right? right? You hear that from black folks all the time. We kneel, you don't like it. We do this, you don't like it, right? right? It's right. like, you must ask for change and demand it. And make, and then it's like the evolution of all things that the arc of then there's anger and then there's more connection and then there's right. more acceptance. Yeah. And yeah, so anger is a doing emotion. So, so, so when you get to that stage, you're willing to to move forward and you want change. So whether it's the individual or whether it's the group, when they get to a place where they've had enough and it's anger, it often means that I'm ready for action. Ah. And, and so that's the movement piece. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and when, I'm, when I'm as a metaphorically um, in your face shouting, then you have to take notice. Right. And so your first initial is to be, oh, my God, you're shouting in my face. But eventually, you're going to have, some of you are going to figure out, well, why, why? are you shouting in my right. face? Right. <laughs> right. That's the point. And the so, so as soon as you start to ask that question, then we can have that conversation. Yes. You know? We can lead you to places and say, why don't you look at that? Have a look at this. Right. And then we can come back again and have another conversation about what it is to be American and what is it to be a a a rightful person that's on this, you know, in this country. Do you know mm, what I mean? So yeah. the, 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 the political and the ideological kind of shift that's happened right now needs to happen. And, and I know that it seems scary for people because they want it to stay the same. But the problem is that staying the same means that I suffer. That means that, you know, uh, uh, the people that I know that have pigment in their, in their skin suffer. It means that anyone that doesn't fall within the, the norms of what is acceptable suffers. That's right. That's the point. And so, you know, the human piece of that is now do we want suffering put upon it on a systemic level or do we want care and love right. in a systemic level? And do we want stability? Because that's right. what some of the people are pushing back against, right? They're saying the rioting, the, the looting, the, the mayhem. And to your point, it's reached a boiling point. Right. 
go ahead and ask us why. Right. Uh, we want to. Everyone wants stability. Right. Right. We want to have culture and cities that are vibrant and full of music and art and people shopping and, and commerce. Up to, yeah. And yeah. Optimism not and, mayhem, yeah. but no one wants the mayhem. But right. it's reached a point where there has to be. Right. Yeah, and I think it's interesting what you talk about the critical mass. It's this is a tipping point. Yeah, I really believe it is, and 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 so many more people are aware of what's going on, you know. And so I just think this is, you know, and maybe it's gonna. It's obviously it's gonna go on longer than I'm alive. But but here's the shift. Yeah. You know? And America is the place to do it because it has the opportunity and the resources and the people to be able to create something that is much closer to what the idea of what America is than anywhere else on the planet, do you know? Well, you, you know a lot about American history, so... Have you, to. Yeah. <laughs> you, if I want to be an American citizen, that's the yeah, thing. Yeah, that's right. We had to, so, yeah. you know, what else So you it mean? seems like you feel really hopeful. Uh, absolutely. When I speak to um, people, uh, particularly those that get it, and I see the different generations and how they're handling it, I recognize the, the, the evolutionary growth of humans. And so that's the piece. We're the ones that are all arguing with one another. <laughs> this, this, this age, and we're all out of the 50s, you know, right, in that right. 60s, where, we, where we, there was this juxtaposition of you're over there and I'm over here, and very insular. Um, um, as we've moved through, there's been more education, more awareness, more media that's, that's shown what the truth is rather than what we're told. Right. And, and it's given people the ability to actually critically think. Yeah. Wait a minute, that's not what I was taught. Right. And that's the first piece, it's just that's right. that bit. And if you can do that bit, you're on the path of, of, of an evolving. Yes. And you know what I mean? You yeah. know, I have to do the same thing when I came here. Oh, you do that, that stuff differently. Let me learn how you do that. Right. And that's how I become a person that is a Mainer, an American. It's right. like you learn about this place so that you can figure out how that fits into your life as equally as I give you something that I come from England. People love the English accent. So I'm already giving you something, right. you know, uh, before we even begin. Right, so, right. So, so as equally as, as Americans and as Mainers are giving me something. You know mm. what I mean? So that's the piece, isn't it? Hmm. So, so I, as I get younger, I, or as I see younger, I just see that happening more. That's encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's great. So, so we'll stop right there because I just saw, I think he's finished now or something like that. Great. But, but excellent. Thanks. Yeah, there it was you really go. fun. Um, yeah. So thank you for uh, uh, coming down. Thank you for, uh, to Melissa for being my guest for today. A, a fantastic conversation that we just have, that we're already just scratch, scratching the surface. And, uh, and I want to just highlight how this is the conversations or types of conversations that we have. Um, my hope is that at some point we'll bring you back again and see how your newspaper is doing and how you're doing as well, and to continue this conversation um, uh, on, on Black Lives Matters, on identity, and this existential shift of America. So, so thank you for being with me, and uh, I look forward to speaking to you again uh, on these subjects. And uh, uh, please uh, have a good, safe journey back. <laughs> yeah.